Thanks. All right, so good morning, everyone. And uh, first of all, thank you for coming to the session. Uh, so uh, today, we're going to be talking about deep learning and the te technology behind self-driving cars. Uh, but before diving into the technical details of the presentation, I'd like to uh, set the scene by uh, taking a look back into the most relevant events in the history of the automobile that, from my perspective, have led us to where we are today in the field of advanced driving assistance systems, or ADAS, and autonomous driving. So we have to go back to the late 1800s to acknowledge what is uh, widely regarded as the world's first production car uh, propelled by an internal combustion engine. Uh, yeah. In 1908, uh, Henry Ford brought the Model T to the masses and really opened up the automotive industry with the first uh, affordable car. Years later, uh, Charles F. Kettering of Dayton Electric Lab, uh, or Delco, patented the electric self-starter, which was a, a huge revolution as it avoided having to use human power to start the engine using the crank. And despite uh, this invention, his, uh, his patent wasn't used commercially until one year later in the Cadillac's production cars. In 1939, uh, General Motors, um, Cadillacs, and Oldsmobile divisions developed the automatic transmission, which eliminated the need to shift gears in the car. And probably a, a huge event for, for ADAS and autonomous driving was uh, the modern cruise control, uh, which was unveiled in the late 50s for the Chrysler Imperial Convertible. Now, interestingly, there's, there's a nice story behind this. Um, this uh, invention is credited to a man Ralph, named Ralph Titor, and uh, he was actually blind. Uh, so the, the inspiration struck him when he was riding with his lawyer as a passenger, and he noticed a tendency in his lawyer of, of slowing down while talking and speeding up while listening. And um, his invention uh, goes back to the mid-40s, but wasn't used commercially in cars until 1958. One of the greatest inventions for safety is the anti-lock braking system that we still use today. And uh, the uh, sure brake system was the first electronically controlled anti-skid system that was able to provide both front and rear wheels from locking up and maintain steering control during a, a full brake stop. And probably the greatest invention for, for all of us here today as, as data scientists, engineers, software engineers, was when we started to put computers in the car. And this first engine control unit, or ECU, was going to be a transformative change in the automotive industry. Uh, since then, there have been many other uh, developments. And from my perspective, the next interesting thing came with connectivity. And all of a sudden, the car was connected to the network in some way. Um, and at first, it was just uh, a cell phone installed in the vehicle that would route calls to a call center and get emergency help when there was an accident. But today, connected cars provide anything between remote diagnostics, uh, over-the-air updates, um, Wi-Fi, turn-by-turn directions, and so on. And then one of the other greatest uh, advancements for, for ADIS was the lane departure warning system, which was developed for the Mercedes-Benz Actros truck. Um, and all of a sudden, the electronics in the vehicle were starting to perceive the world around it. And this is a very important point. The whole concept of having a computer um, make decisions or help you make decisions, that's at the heart of what AI is bringing to ADAS and, and autonomous driving. All right, so if we look into the fields of, of automated driving, there are really uh, a lot of things we can cover. And um, just to mention a few and to set the scene, we can talk about controls, perception, and localization and planning. And we won't be covering all of these, uh, but maybe let's, let's uh, talk about a few trends. Uh, in controls, uh, sensor models and, and model predictive control. So as the vehicle is becoming more and more intelligent, one of the things that we need, need to really care about is the um, accuracy of the sensors uh, playing a significant role in the control systems themselves. Uh, also, in motor predictive control, as, as we're becoming more of a passenger, we need to balance out be behavior as, as well as ride and comfort. In localization and planning, researchers are uh, integrating their algorithms with ROS, the robot operating system, uh, to solve problems like path planning. 
And in perception, the fields of deep learning, which we'll cover deeply today, and sense of fusion, where you would like to fuse data together coming from, from different sensors to assess the world around them. Now, covering all these areas uh, in 30 minutes is, is barely impossible, so uh, we'll be talking about, uh, mostly about deep learning and maybe mention also a few of the sensors involved uh, in, in sensor fusion. So, of course, uh, in traditional machine learning approaches, um, we, have to, we have to have a, some sort of feature extraction mechanism uh, uh, to learn discriminative information from images or from data. Well, well, I suppose in, uh, in deep learning, we're going to be working uh, directly from, from raw data, uh, and this provides an end-to-end -end learning mechanism. Right? So we're going to start talking about convolutional neural networks. So a convolutional neural network, often uh, referred to as ConfNet or CNN, is a type of deep neural network that can work directly on structured data, like images, in order to, for instance, classify them. Now, um, one of the important things is that uh, because of the deepness in the, uh, in the network, we're going to be eliminating the need for creating handcrafted features. And so uh, deep neural networks provide feature learning. And as opposed also to classic approaches, in, in this case, we'll be dealing with networks that have any, anything from uh, five to hundreds and even thousands of layers. Uh, so, and because for this, we're going to need um, very big data sets, GPUs are going to play a big role in the training process uh, of these confnets. And if we think of the architecture, um, here's a simple architecture uh, of a CNN, and you can think of these architecture as uh, maybe as the representation of the data as it travels through the network. So we're going to start with an, image, uh, with an image or an image input layer, um, then we're going to have several convolution, ReLU pooling layers, up to the point where we are going to flatten the activations and work with fully connected layers, uh, and finally a softmax function to classify our, our data. And uh, the interesting thing here is that uh, all these layers are going to be trained together. So uh, the training process is going to involve adjusting weights in all these uh, layers uh, for the network to, uh, to do the task. Also, another important thing is that the um, uh, very first layers are going to be involved in learning the features, while the last layers will be uh, performing the classification. All right, so now that we've looked into the uh, most popular architecture, we can take a look at the deep, typical deep learning workflow. So we're going to start by accessing and exploring our data, which, again, can come in the form of images, signals, files, text. Um, then we're going to go through a um, labeling process, and this is, one, this is probably one of the very, uh, one of the tedious tasks that frequently nobody wants to do. Uh, we have to properly label our training data. Um, if the data that we have available is insufficient, then we uh, might work with synthetic data or use other techniques such as data augmentation, which basically consists of using the, the data that you have available and perform operations that are object invariant with that data, like cropping or reflections or translations, rotations, uh, to enhance the data set. Then we can choose our network architecture. Here, in this case, we'll be using the deep, uh, MATLAB's deep learning framework. And we can either build the networks from scratch, or we can work with um, pre-trained networks uh, from research uh, to perform maybe transfer learning. Uh, also, we can leverage the interoperability with other frameworks uh, like CAFE or, or TensorFlow or Onyx. And then it's time to perform the training, either in the CPU or the GPU, um, scale to, to multiple GPUs or the cloud if we have them available. And we can even perform hyperparameter tuning to come up with the optimal set of parameters uh, for, for, our, for our network. And finally, we, we, we have to share work in some way. Um, we might do that either in the MATLAB framework itself, or we can export the network to, to Onyx. Onyx stands for the Open Neural Network Exchange Format. Uh, we can also uh, choose to, to um, put our models in production in enterprise scale systems, or even generate C++ and CUDA code for very fast inference. All right, so let's start with what seems a priori the most time-consuming task, which is labeling the ground truth data. 
And so for that, we have developed a set of tools, uh, one of which is Ground Truth Labeler, and I'm going to guide you through the process of labeling uh, the data. So in this case, I can import data in either video, uh, sequences of images, or uh, a specific video that um, might have a specific compressors or specific file formats that you may want to read from. Here I'm just loading simply some video. I can inspect through my video timeline um, to see what the data looks like. And uh, typically, it's convenient to work with a subset of the video, since uh, small movements of your hand can mean large changes in the video timeline. So here I'm just zooming in an interval to work within just those bounds. And I'm going to start defining labels. Um, so in this case, uh, I'm going to define the label car, uh, as well as the lanes. Um, I'm going to give the, the car label a rectangle shape. And I can put a label description to tell others on my team on how to properly label this data. In this case, uh, using a tight, tight bounding box, or a bounding box that's very close to the, um, to the boundary of the, of the object. And then I, I can go and label a few of these. Um, the next thing I can do is, is um, use uh, other type of labels. In this case, uh, for the lane markers, we're going to be using uh, a line label instead of a rectangle shape. And as you can see, I can uh, go through my video, and in this case, this frame, click with the mouse and right-click to stop to label those. Now, another interesting thing if, about labeling is when you need to label an entire image or an entire timestamp, and for that, we have scene labels. A scene is something that is true for an entire image or an entire period of time. So here we can define, for instance, the weather conditions, whether it's sunny or not sunny, uh, or even the lightning conditions, uh, if they're shadows or not. And now it is the process of applying those labels to the uh, selected data. So we can either add a label to the current frame, and as you can see in the top corner, uh, only the first frame has been labeled as sunny and with shadows, or we can do that for the entire, entire time interval. All right, so the next thing is, is how, to, how do I automate this process? And that's really the, 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 the most time-consuming task. So for that, we have developed a set of algorithms, and also uh, we provide uh, an open API so that you can build your own auto algorithms to automate the, the ground, ground truth labeling process. In this case, I'm just going to uh, automate the detection of this car, and for that, I will be selecting a point tracker. Uh, now, as you can see here in the interface, there's this uh, alg add algorithm and import algorithm API that I'll show you later. But for now, I'll just go with point tracker. And I'm going to just simply click Automate. I can configure some of the detection process, like, uh, for instance, which type of feature detector I'm going to use in the first frame, uh, which in this case, uh, I'm just going to leave the defaults, and just go and hit Run. So in just about a second, I labeled uh, that, that data, and I can go back, inspect it. I can make any changes or make any adjustments if needed. And when I'm done, I go in and click Accept. Right. Excellent. Now, the next thing is we may want to know what the distribution of the labels looks like. Uh, so for that, uh, we can go to the View Labels Summary. And in here, I can seek through my video timeline, and I can take a look at what has been labeled. Maybe there are specific, uh, specific ROIs, so specific labels that I want to take a look at, or maybe there are specific scenes that I might have to pay close, close attention to. Uh, so that's, that's convenient for seeking through video. And then the very last part is exporting this data. So um, in order to do that, uh, I'm just going to uh, go to export labels, and I have a few options whether I can export to workspace or a file. In this case, I'm exporting to the workspace as a ground truth object that I can later use uh, uh, for, for maybe a deep learning algorithm. And, and this object contains the data source, so the video that I imported, it contains the label definitions, so the two car labels, uh, or the, the car labels, sorry, the lane markers, and then the, the two scene labels. And finally, it contains the label data. Uh, first frame contains the manually automated, the, the manually labeled data, and then, uh, or the first uh, timestamp contains the manually labeled data, and then there is one second of automatically labeled data. All right. Um, so the next thing is, what if the 
uh, available algorithms that we provide uh, do not do the tasks that you need to perform. Then you can create your own algorithm using the provided API. And in here, we're just doing lane markers. So uh, we have uh, a template that inherits from uh, vision.labeler.automation algorithm that implements several methods, uh, one of which is the run method that is basically the one doing most of the work. Right? Uh, so here in this case, I'm simply just going to import that, uh, that class in the MATLAB in the, in, in the tool framework by going to import algorithm, selecting the file, and then uh, it, will come up, it, it will come available in the tool. So I'm just going to hit, uh, click the right line and left line in this case, and automate this process. So I go to select algorithm, I find my auto line detector, I hit automate, and then uh, I need to provide the sensor variable and uh, hit run. Then I can review the, uh, th this process, and if there are any adjustments that need to be made, I can do that manually. All right. So we've, we've gone through the process of, of labeling ROIs, and if we follow this path towards creating a detector, we'll be doing ROI detection. Uh, now, <coughs> in automated driving, um, sometimes, uh, frequently, ROI detection isn't enough, and we need much more accuracy. And for that, uh, the other problem we can solve is pixel-level classification. So each pixel being uh, classified as, as one or other label. So. There comes another um, tedious task, which is labeling uh, pixel by pixel uh, every image. And, and for that, uh, the tool provides uh, also the capability to label uh, images at the pixel level. And here I'm just going to show you quickly how, how we can do that. Um, in this case, I'm going to define a few ROIs, but this time the ROIs are going to be pixel labels instead of rectangles. So I'm just going to define road, vegetation, um, the skies, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and then I can use the tools available in the app to fill the sky, for instance, using float fill. I can use a smart polygon to estimate where the shape or where the vegetation is, and then use uh, different foreground and, and background editors to uh, uh, adjust the, the the detection process. And and this is how it works. It's it's a time-consuming uh, problem that can be automated in some way as well. Um, but this is the way, the way you do it. And also, there's a smart way to do this, because every pixel can have at most one label, uh, so you can do that wisely, uh, as we're doing here, uh, labeling the road prior to labeling the car, for instance. Also, another interesting thing is when you're labeling, you might need to know what parts of your um, uh, of your image haven't yet been labeled, and for that you modify the opacity as we did, and, and, and you can take a look at, at, what's, at what's left. <coughs> All right, so in this case now, we're going to be solving the problem of pixel level classification using a semantic segmentation network. Um, so for that, let's go back to the uh, convolutional neural network that, that we know about. So this is a convolutional neural network. You have an image as an input, and you have classes as the output. So the entire image is being classified as one of these uh, labels. Uh, and as you can see, you have several convolution, ralu, and, and pooling layers. Here we've indicated the pooling layers in green to indicate that this is a downsampling operation. And now, to perform the semantic segmentation network, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to um, redo the work, so we kind of have an anti-pooling layer um, to uh, end up having the output image uh, uh, of the same size as the original image. So now we have an input image and the output image of the same size. In this case, now every pixel is going to have been labeled uh, uh, with, a, with a different class. And here's one of the problems we can solve. This is um, figuring out what the drivable path is. And for this example, we're using publicly available, available data. It's the Cambit data set. So we don't have to go through the process of labeling. Uh, but if we had to, you, you've seen how we can do that. Um, so let's see how that works. First, we're going to load some, some, um, some, some data. And for that, we have a uh, data store, which is a way to load data into MATLAB very efficiently. Um, 
then we can, um, what we're doing here is uh, using also a histogram equalization to, um, to enhance the, the, uh, the image. Because actually the, the image is quite, it's quite dark. And uh, maybe if, if, if somebody can, uh, the screen is about to turn off, sorry. And I don't want to turn your back on you. Um, if somebody from, uh, from the team can, can take a look and I'll make sure it doesn't. Um, so uh, then we have a pixel label data store. So uh, we have, um, uh, we have uh, label data at pixel level. So we're going to be able to load those with, with the pixel label data store. And in here, in this case, we're actually uh, um, able to uh, visualize an image and overlay the pixel labels on top. Uh, another thing we can do then is we can take a look, or we can look into the insights of, um, of, of, of the data. And, and here, if we take a look, we will notice that um, the, the data set is a little bit imbalanced. And so uh, this, uh, this data set will uh, pretty much do a good job in detecting roads, but will probably not do a good job in detecting some, something like a bicyclists. So if we want to detect bicyclists, we probably need to go through the process of um, collecting more, more data and, and labeling it. All right, uh, the next thing is we're going to be using uh, a semantic segmentation network. So for that, we have the segment uh, layers uh, function in MATLAB that will take VGG16 weights and do the necessary work to um, upload uh, the network. Now, interestingly here, this, is, um, this type of network is a, is a DAC network uh, or a directed a cyclic graph network. And in this particular case, it has a, um, a downsampling, upsampling architecture or encoder, decoder, depending on how you'd like to call that. So um, after that, we want to find a way to compensate for the imbalanced data. And so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be changing the last layer in the, in the, in the network and taking into account the, the, the weights uh, of, of, uh, of the pixels available in the data. Uh, so we do some replacement, we remove some layers, we add some connections, and, and we replace the, the last layer. Uh, we can use data augmentation to expand the training data set. Here we're performing some reflections, uh, rotations, and translations in X and Y. And that's very convenient uh, when, when your data set is, is not massive. And then we can go through the training process. Uh, and here you see the execution environment has been set to auto. So uh, in this particular case, we're, we're going to be training on the GPU, if you, if you have one. Or otherwise, we'll train on the, on the CPU. But um, if if we have multiple GPUs available, or if we have access to a cloud or, or a cluster, uh, we can either use multi-GPU or, or parallel. All right, th then we go through the process of, of training. And I've lost my slides here. But, and um, this trains in roughly uh, uh, 1,000 minutes with one GPU. And after that, um, Basically, what we can do is we can evaluate the train network, taking a look here at a single image and looking at the output of the network, seeing we, can over, we are overlaying the image and looking at how well it classifies. We can compare against the expected output or the ground truth label. We can look at the differences between each other. Thank you. And, um, and we can compute metrics, because uh, at the end of the day, it's what we need. So in this case, we're using the intersection of a union, which is a popular metric for semantic segmentation. So then we can look at the whole uh, test data set that we may have spared. And in this case, we are uh, evaluating the against uh, a whole bunch of data. And again, we look at things, we, we kind of have results that we, we kind of would have expect. If we want to, um, if we want to detect roads or skies, we have pretty good odds. Um, but if we want to detect something like bicyclists, uh, the network is, is not performing as well. So some of those underrepresented classes will not perform well, and therefore we'll need to collect more data and label it. OK, so so far we've been looking at, uh, at data coming from images, right? Um, so images uh, are great because they provide great range. It's the sensor with the farthest range, more than 200 meters. 
but it lacks of uh, the ability to uh, detect proximity or um, or working the dark conditions or detect speed. And for that, there are many other sensors that, that can play a role in ADIS and, and auto autonomous driving. Some of the sensors are li uh, radar or ultrasonic or LiDAR. So <clears throat> in, in this particular case, I want to mention the fact that uh, how important sensor fusion is. Uh, and if we leave LiDAR out for now and we look at the cheap sensors, which are the remaining three, this is kind of what sensor fusion looks like. So you see that if we're able to work with multiple sensors, then we have good data to work under all conditions, all scenarios. Now, uh, today's talk, unfortunately, is on deep learning, so we won't be covering uh, sensor fusion much, but uh, I want to talk about the, the sensor that has been left out, which in this case was LiDAR. So LiDAR stands for uh, Light Detection and Ranging, and, and here you see a LiDAR device on top of the, this retrofitted Google car. And uh, basically, it consists uh, of um, it's a, it's a device that continuously a 360 degree sensor that continuously fires off beams of laser light and then measures how long it takes for the light to return back to the sensor. So, what does that later look like when we look in in, in, the, in the computer? Uh, so, it it looks like this. So, we have um, on the left we have uh, video and on the right hand side we have a synchronized point cloud data coming from LiDAR. So the next thing we want to do is uh, see how we can um, develop a deep neural network using LiDAR data. And the greatest challenge here is going to be on data preparation and labeling. That's the part that is uh, really tedious. So accessing the data, pre-processing it, and labeling it. So I want to go first into accessing and labeling data. And so in MATLAB, we have uh, efficient ways to uh, read from the standard in industry, is, which is uh, Velodyne pickup files. Uh, so we will be using that in this case. And also, we need efficient way to, to visualize the data. So we have uh, very efficient streaming point cloud players to, to view this type of data in MATLAB. So first thing is accessing the data. Uh, or pre next thing is pre-processing the data, excuse me. And so for here, uh, we're going to have to be a little uh, cautious, because as you can see, uh, there, uh, there's quite a lot of noise in this image. Uh, those circular rings are uh, bouncing off the ground. Uh, that's, that's basically uh, information coming from the ground, so we want to remove that. So in this case, we're going to fit a plane um, using an algorithm called Ransack, uh, so that we can remove those ground points, because that ground is basically noise. And one we have, once we have those points removed, uh, we want to go from uh, these point clouds to objects by performing a clustering algorithm. Okay, so here we're just simply performing a very simple Euclidean-based segmentation algorithm. And once we have that, we have to go through the process of labeling. And for that, we've developed a prototype um, that basically what it does, it, it snaps a bounding box to a cluster. And you don't have to then um, go and adjust the, the, the limits of these bounding box. Uh, so that's very convenient. So we can label um, yeah, cars and um, bicyclists and so on and so forth. Now, if, if you have some unique insight into your data, MATLAB can be quite handy because uh, if, for instance, uh, you rotate the image, maybe it's much easier to label the cars from a top view than, than from a 3D view and still be able to collect 3D labels at the end of the day. So this labeler has labeled in a 2D view, and then when you rotate it, uh, you have 3D collected labels. All right, and the next thing is, how do we automate this process? Because that's the ideal part. Uh, so in here, we're going to be selecting a few objects, and um, in this case, we're going to use a tracking algorithm to track those objects and be able to perform or to predict the position of the object in the next frame, in the next frame, in the next frame, and thus label the data set. So this ends up saving a lot of time. So what's, what comes next? So in terms of uh, classifying individual point clouds, we decide to use a popular uh, network from research from Stanford uh, from 2017, which is called PointNet. 
And the idea basically here is just to classify the point clouds as objects. Um, so here you have this for reference, but this is a very uh, straightforward um, uh, convolutional neural network, very, sim very similar to the ones we saw earlier for images, but in this case for point clouds, that consists of several uh, MLPs. And I'm not going to go into much details of how it works or why it works, but I'll show you some, some data. So here's some of the output from the classification process. I'm not sure if you can see this well, but you probably see uh, on the left-hand side a point cloud that has been classified as a car, and on the right-hand side uh, what it seems to be a bicyclist that has been classified under the label none. Uh, in this case, we have three labels uh, for this uh, specific problem, cars, trucks, and, and none. Now, another option we may have in mind is to use uh, semantic segmentations like we used before. Uh, in this case, we're going to be using uh, LinkNet, which is a much lightweight uh, uh, semantic segmentation network. So we still have to uh, collect the data, cluster it, and label it, but uh, we have to figure out a way on how to organize the data for training. And for that, what we're going to do is basically we're going to project the data or the point cloud on 2D so that we work with X, Y, and C data and the uh, labeled, uh, uh, the labeled uh, point cloud data projected in 2D. So we basically turn the problem into a standard semantic segmentation problem, working with images in this case now. Uh, so for that, uh, this is the architecture of, um, of LinkNet. It's again uh, an uh, encoder-decoder architecture, like, like the one we used earlier. And here you see how, how we can use uh, the Matlab API as well to build this type of network. Um, interestingly, um, one of the greatest things of these DAG networks is that, the, uh, for instance, the uh, decoder block 2 can have access to um, very low-level information co coming from encoder block 1, as well as high-level information flowing through, uh, through the architecture. So LinkNet uses uh, ResNet 18, or is based off ResNet 18. Uh, in this case, I'm using multiple GPUs uh, for, for uh, training the algorithm, and this can roughly take about 30 minutes on a standard workstation with uh, a few GPUs. And then we go through the last part of the, of, the, of the process of the workflow, which is, if you recall, it was about deployment. So we need to deploy this in some way. And um, the way we're doing it is through MATLAB's GPU coder that allows you to generate C++ and CUDA code that you can then embed in some type of embedded system, like an NVIDIA, PX, uh, NVIDIA, NVIDIA Drive PX2 that could be on board of the vehicle. If anybody's interested in, in benchmarking against other frameworks, this is how MATLAB's GPU coder uh, stands. Um, Y-axis represents the number of frames per second, and the X-axis represents the size of the batch, or the number of images that you put at once through the uh, GPU. Uh, in green, you see uh, MATLAB GPU coder with QD and N in the back end, and in orange and, and gray, you see using TensorRT. Um, of course, with int8 data types, this is uh, much faster inference. And then um, ResNet, again, on an NVIDIA Titan V, uh, comparing MATLAB and TensorFlow, both for single and int8 uh, precision. So this is the final result. This is what it looks like. Um, you can see the point cloud, and you can see the segmentation process being done real time. And you can see that as the cars get closer to the LiDAR device where there are more points, uh, they're uh, much better classified. All right, so this is about it. Uh, if you want to learn more about uh, perception algorithms uh, for, math, for deep learning and automated driving with MATLAB, I, I recommend you to take a look at these two websites. Um, also, um, find uh, time to visit us at the booth. There are some really interesting demos you can take a look at. Uh, and yeah, with that, um, thank you very much, and uh, enjoy the conference. So there's time for, for questions, if there are any. All right, so I'll stick around for a while. Feel free to, to come by. All right, thanks.